So we wanted to start uh, first tonight with um, our guest speaker, who is Kathy Kiley. And I had the good fortune to live on a street in Columbia and a new neighbor moved in and I was good friends with the next door neighbor and, and she said to me, oh, Marilyn, this new neighbor is on the faculty of the journalism school. And I said, oh yes, <laughs> that is great. So I've had opportunities to chat with her from time to time in the last year, I guess. We met outside uh, in, in the uh, fall and last summer. Uh, Kathy Kiley is our guest speaker and uh, she is a veteran reporter and editor with a long career covering politics in Washington. We're fortunate that she is here in Columbia and at the University of Missouri Journalism School and where she served as an editor for the Columbia Missourian, helped to redesign the J School's core curriculum. And as she said, works to advance news literacy in mid-Missouri. She's a graduate of Princeton University and has a master's degree from American University. She frequently writes op-eds in the Missourian, so you've probably seen them. But I was recently struck by a recent one where she said, democracy is a fragile thing, which of course caught my attention because as members of the league, uh, I think we recognize that, we've recognized that all along and uh, we are literally still fighting to protect democracy as we speak at the state capitol, in fact, today. So at this time, I'll, uh, turn the podium over to Ms. Kiley for her reflections on this. And I know she said she's very much interested in this being a kind of conversation. So if you have comments or questions, you can add them to the chat feature and I'll monitor them and share them with Kathy. So thank you again for being with us and I'll let you begin the discussion. I might say one word for the best viewing opportunity if you will click your, spe your speaker view in the upper right hand corner you will be able to see her more clearly. Thank you. Um, well thanks Marilyn for asking me. I'm really honored uh, to be here and I think the League of Women Voters you know as a longtime political reporter I've had a lot of interactions with the League of Women Voters. And um, so I think it's an important institution in our democracy. And uh, like all institutions uh, in our democracy, we're in a little bit of trouble. So uh, that's what I wanna talk about tonight. Um, you know, democracy is a fragile thing. It's something I've given a lot of thought to. Uh, and in many ways, it's why I'm here, uh, why I'm in mid-Missouri, serving as the Lee Hills Chair in Free Press Studies at the Missouri School of Journalism and not still in a newsroom in Washington uh, because I think we have work to do. Um, so in his first press conference as president, uh, which was just last month, um, Joe Biden said something that I thought was really striking. And I don't think it got a lot of attention because it was his first press conference as president and there was a lot of other news that he made. But towards the end of the press conference, um, he said that when the history of this era is written, it will be about, and this is his quote, who succeeded, democracy or autocracy? That's what's at stake here. That's what Joe Biden said. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a pretty startling thing for an American president to say, I think, at least for those of us who have seen a lot of American presidents. And it's pretty startling considering where we were not that many years ago. So I was there, I was really lucky to be there at the absolute apogee of Western capitalist democracy. I got to cover the fall of the Berlin Wall. I was there, I saw it happen. And I think probably all of you, uh, we are all children of the Cold War, I think. Maybe there's a few people who are too young to be that, but most of us here are. And so I think probably I don't need to tell you what 
what an amazing thing that was. I mean, the fall of the Berlin Wall and, uh, and I think we all remember the euphoria of that time, you know, the triumph of truth, justice and the American way, right? And it was the end of history. Remember Francis Fukushima's, uh, Fukuyama's book? Um, and, you know, uh, this was the end of the Cold War, the end of all these conflicts, the triumph of everything America stood for. And how did we get from there, from people dancing on top of the Brandenburg Gate to people storming the United States Capitol looking for lawmakers to lynch. How did that happen? And you know, I'm not exactly sure. I think it was um, Donald Trump. <laughs> well, <laughs> let's- Because let's, he was so influenced by Russia. Let's hold that thought. Because <laughs> there's a lot that led up to Donald Trump. Um, but, um, and, and that's what I want to talk about, actually. I mean, um, I think we, we want to talk about what led up to the last couple of years. And to talk a little bit about that, I want to tell you what we journalists call a telling anecdote. You know, this would be the anecdotal lead we use. And it's about the National Press Club. You know, I worked in Washington, D.C. for many, many, many years, and I'm not going to tell you how many. You can look it up. Um, but um, I, I was a member of the National Press Club, and you've probably all heard of the National Press Club. You may have heard speakers from the National Press Club. NPR likes to broadcast some of those talks. Um, and it has been a place where uh, politicians of various parties have come to announce their campaign for president. Um, we've had, you know, we have hallways filled with photographs of the distinguished people who have spoken there. Journalists hang out there, PR people are members. It's, it's been around for many, many years and it's kind of a Washington institution. And so, uh, and the National Press Club does a lot of charitable work too, like uh, big institutions and it has a nonprofit uh, wing called the uh, National Press Club Journalism Institute, which raises money for worthy causes like uh, press freedom and, um, and First Amendment defense and, uh, and for scholarships for kids uh, who want to be journalists. So, um, so those are all pretty good causes. I think, you know, kind of apple pie types of causes that you would think most folks would support. And, um, and so the Press Club has a lot of fundraisers uh, for, for its little do good kitty. And uh, one of the best fundraisers that the press club has, because it's so much fun, is the National Press Club Spelling Bee. And it, we bring in the actual Scripps Howard people who run the real Spelling Bee uh, to run that, uh, this Titanic contest, which is always the press versus the politicians. And it's really a lot of fun. The press and the Pauls fight it out on who's the best spellers. And people come and they have a few libations and some food and all the money uh, gets put towards scholarships for high school kids who want to go to college and be journalists. Okay. So one of the folks at the press club asked me if I could come and say a few words at the beginning of the spelling bee about the National Press Club Journalism Institute. And, uh, and so I said, sure. And this was a great thing because I got to go to the cocktail party before the spelling bee. And all the spellers were there and there were a number of senators and members of Congress. And, um, and then there were a lot of reporters who I knew who were gonna show their spelling chops. And so I'm standing in the room and there were some big, big time people there like Dick Durbin, who's the deputy uh, democratic leader in the Senate, you know, people who had a, other important things to do. But nonetheless, they were there and they were all having a lot of fun. And I looked around the room and I looked around the room and I pulled aside one of my friends who I knew had helped organize this event. And I said, where are the Republicans? Because this was really shocking to me. I mean, we're a nonpartisan institution. 
And, um, we, you know, we always have both parties represented. And um, I saw these big time Democrats and I didn't see a single Republican. And my friend who I know is a very hardworking organizer and like any member of the fourth estate is going to do their best to be nonpartisan said, we asked and none of them would come. And this was just a couple years ago. Uh, I think Barack Obama was president and it really sent a chill down my spine because I could see what was happening in Washington. And I could see that um, there was a strategic decision that was being made by members of one of our major political parties to not be seen with members of other, another political party or with journalists. And so a year or two after that, I was organizing a big event at the National Press Club. And I too was struggling to get Republicans to be on a panel. And I finally, I'm a very uh, long time reporter and I have a lot of sources. And I had to put my arm on, I don't know how many of them and say, look, you have got to get somebody here. And I got one brave Republican to come and be on a panel. I mean, this was a series of panels. And I knew by then what was going on. And it really reminded me in a very creepy way about when I was in the Middle East covering the conflicts there. And in Israel, if you are people who are Jewish or people who are Palestinian, who want to work together really have a hard time. I mean, they told me this because if you reach out to the other side, you are labeled a collaborator and collaborators get killed. And here, if you reach out to the other side, you're labeled a collaborator and you can be politically erased. So, how did, how did we get there? And by the way, this is not just a Washington problem and it's not just a press problem. Because I'm gonna tell you another story. I'm working right now with the Daniel Boone Regional Library on news literacy. And uh, I brought in a group of experts um, from a, NGO called IREX to help the Daniel Boone Regional Library plan some programming around news literacy. And as you know, the Daniel Boone Regional Library serves both Boone and Callaway counties. And one of the things that I said is we wanna make sure that we serve all of your constituency and how can we make sure that we reach people who, you know, for whom it might not be so easy to get to the Daniel Boone Regional Library at night for an event or, and, and how can we reach other people, some of the Callaway County folks. So we were having a discussion about this uh, with the IREX people and the IREX people said to the DBRL people, um, so what are some public events you do and who are some of the people you partner with who you're most successful with? And the Daniel Boone Regional Library people said, oh, the League of Women Voters. They're a great partner. They do events at our library all the time. And so, you know, we started talking about that. And uh, suddenly, because politics, of course, was the elephant in the room, um, one of the librarians said, but you know, some of our Callaway County people would think the League of Women Voters is liberal. So we're at a point where institutions that were created to be nonpartisan, like the League of Women Voters, like news organizations, and which really go out of their way to be nonpartisan, I think, have been labeled partisan. And it's kind of perverse. It's almost like, uh, well, um, you're 
seen as partisan because you're not nonpartisan, because we're in an era when if you're not 100% with somebody, that somebody views you as 100% against them. Is this dinging any bells for anybody? Does this sound familiar? So how has this happened? I, again, I'm not sure, but I think this is one reason. Um, and this is one reason I'm doing news literacy because we're living in a communications revolution. Uh, and um, it, it's, I mean, there's not just gonna be a chapter in a history book written about this. There is gonna be, there are going to be multiple history books written about the impact that digitization has had on the way we communicate. So it's a great technology. Look at, look at how we're benefiting from it right here in the middle of the pandemic. We're having this meeting um, and it's wonderful. And I'm sure you've been able to stay in touch with your family. Uh, despite all of this. So let's not, you know, let's appreciate and acknowledge what a great thing this is. However, like all new technology, um, this technology and this brave new world has a dark side. And, um, and so one thing it has done is it has created an enormous existential crisis for my business because um, advertising dollars that used to go to news outlets are now going to Google or Facebook or any one of a number of other platforms. Um, and we'll get into some of those platforms in a minute. Um, none of which employ reporters. So newsrooms have been hollowed out. I think you've seen some of that right here in Columbia with the Tribune. Or they've been completely shuttered. I mean, we're very lucky that we have two newspapers in Columbia, but part of that is because one of them is part of the Missouri School of Journalism. So meanwhile, so the newsrooms, the traditional legacy newsrooms, very much shadows of them, their former selves. Meanwhile, everyone with one of these is a publisher. And that means an explosion of new voices and new information, which is great, but some of those new voices are dangerously bigoted. And a lot of that information, to use the technical newsroom term, is crap. And everybody now gets their news from social media. Um, and let me just share to what degree this is happening. I just want to share with you a little survey I did just this week with some of my students. Uh, I make them do a media diary. So I'm going to try to share my screen and in, oh wait, I can't do that. Um, okay, I'll just tell you. Um, so I made my students do a media survey, a, a survey of their media habits and keep a media diary. And I told them, I said, if you've ever kept a food diary, this is going to be even more of a pain in the you know what, because you consume a lot more media than you do food. And, um, and so I had them keep a 48 hour diary and I asked them to write down every time they interacted with media and where they were getting information. And then I went through these diaries and I tallied the results. This is where MU journalism school students are getting their information. Leader of the pack, Instagram. Number two, Twitter. Number three, Snapchat. Number four, TikTok. Number five, Spotify. Number six, YouTube. Number seven, TV. Then there's a whole bunch of other things and way at the bottom of the pack, New York Times newsletter, one person. NewYorkTimes.com, one person. IBD.com, which is a business daily, one person. CNN, one. Wall Street Journal newsletter, one. All those other ones had like 
dozens of votes or dozens of touches, right? Notice what's not on there. News sites, the Columbia Missourian, because it's not that those students, they will be reading some stuff from the New York Times and the Columbia Missourian, but they're not getting it by going to those websites. They're getting it by, by seeing things in a social media feed. Now my students are pretty sophisticated because there would be journalists and we're giving them the best training. But most people who go on to Spotify or TikTok, the other thing you didn't see there by the way is Facebook, which most of us use, right? Because we're behind the times. Um, but if you go to Facebook or any of these social media outlets, um, you know, Crazy Uncle Vinny's post looks pretty much the same as the Columbia Missourians or the New York Times. And to people who aren't sophisticated about understanding what a good news source is and what isn't, um, it's hard to distinguish reliable, uh, well-sourced, reported news from just somebody's opinion um, or propaganda. Uh, so that's one of the big problems. Um, and the other big problem uh, has to do with the reason people opt for those outlets. Um, you know, they're free, right? You don't have to pay a check to the Columbia Tribune every month or pony up for the KBIA, Begathon. Um, they're free and convenient. They're right on your phone. Except that, of course, nothing is free. And we're paying, uh, not with our money, but with our data, every time we log on to one of those sites, every time we swipe a credit card in our cashless economy, uh, we are leaving a trail of data. And that data is being used um, by algorithms to serve up information that's likely to keep us on the internet platforms we're using. Uh, there is very little motivation for Google or Facebook or YouTube to serve you up stories that are going to make you uncomfortable. And they know what stories are gonna make you uncomfortable because they know you. They know a lot about you. And it's profit motive, but that profit motive has created what we call the filter bubble. And for people who are getting most of their information online, which is most of us now, um, that, alters your perspective because you are not getting information you, you disagree with and you are not seeing other perspectives besides yours. And there's a parallel phenomenon to this in the physical world called the big sort. And uh, this comes from the title of a book. The Filter Bubble is also the title of a book, by the way, uh, by a guy named Eli Pariser, who first identified this phenomenon. He's a real internet maven and gave a TED talk about it and that led to a book. But The Big Sort is a book by a, a guy named Bill Bishop, who is a journalist, kind of an intellectual um, uh, from Texas. And he wrote this book, I think it was in like 2007. And he noticed something, uh, which now, I mean, I, you've seen New York Times infographics about it, but it's the tendency we all have, that, like this homing instinct, to move to places, like physically actually move to places that where people, uh, like-minded people live. And, um, and so what, and I can't remember the actual numbers, I should have looked them up, but, uh, but Bishop has all kinds of compelling data in this book. Um, but what the thing he points out is that he goes back a number of years and looks at elections and he looks at how many counties were decided, you know, in the presidential race by uh, three or four point margins. And that number has been radically diminished. Um, there tend to be more landslide counties now. Um, so people are living in like-minded clusters. Um, and it's weird, but 
both of these phenomena, I think we need to be aware of because it alters our perspective. You know, I really think I can understand why people, when I lived in DuPont Circle in Washington, DC, which is about as liberal as you can get, I had neighbors who would come up to me and say, how could George Bush win the election? And I'd say, you know, you really need to get out of DuPont Circle because I was traveling quite a bit. And, you know, you can see where people who are living not very far from us probably don't know anybody who's voted for Joe Biden. And so when people say the election was stolen, they think, well, yeah, I don't know anybody who Joe voted for Joe Biden. Probably it was, right? So I think we are living in these silos um, that um, have really, uh, have really distorted our perspective on the world we live in. And so it's made democracy a fragile thing because we don't talk to each other. We don't trust each other. Um, and how we get out of this, I think, is it's not going to be an overnight solution. It's not going to be a magic app. It's not going to be a wave of any wand. I think we have to commit ourselves to talking to each other, even if we are angry, even if we are mad, um, even if we, because if we stay angry, I mean, the great poet W.B. Yeats, uh, when he was writing about at a time when Ireland was in a near civil war, um, said this about his times, and, and I keep, it keeps echoing in my ears about our times. He said, the best lack all conviction, the worst are full of passionate intensity. The worst are full of passionate intensity. And I'm seeing it on both sides. I'm seeing it definitely more on one side than the other, but I'm seeing it on both sides and it becomes a very toxic feedback loop. And so there's another way. And I'm just gonna end with one last story because from my a war story, um, because it's uplifting. I used to work for the Houston Post, a newspaper that no longer exists like so many of them. And I love working for the Houston Post because we had the craziest delegation. I mean, I had people just across the spectrum and all kinds of different personalities because they do not elect blow dried politicians in Texas. And so one of my uh, guys who I covered a lot uh, from the, I can't remember what his congressional district number was, but uh, it was from a Houston, downtown Houston congressional district. It was a guy named Mickey Leland. And Mickey Leland was one of the first African-American uh, lawmakers in Texas and state legislature and then went into Congress. He succeeded Barbara Jordan, who maybe some of you remember. Um, and um, at one point, and Mickey was just this uh, just larger than life character and he wore dashikis. And he, at one point his Afro was, I think about as wide as the Potomac River. And Mickey was so liberal that he would think nothing. He would fly to Cuba and have dinner all night with Fidel Castro and get a kid from Houston released from drug jail and then wonder why I thought that was a story. You know, he just, uh, that was Mickey. And in, it, in the next district over was a guy named Jack Fields, who was like one of the whitest guys I ever knew. He was so buttoned down that, I mean, his hair was never out of place. It never, 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 never. And he was a Southern Baptist, didn't drink, super straight laced, and super, super conservative. And so these guys were so politically different that um, maybe you remember that during this time, uh, the stories were coming out about the terrible, terrible famine in Ethiopia, and the world was just galvanized by it. And so Mickey, who was very cognizant of his roots in Africa, uh, became a real leader in this, and uh, he led a uh, an effort to provide U.S. funding uh, to end the famine. And it was a big deal. And so, of course, I covered it because our guy was in charge. And on the day of the vote, uh, which passed overwhelmingly, by the way, I get a call from Jack Fields. And Jack wanted me to know and put in the paper that he was voting against aid for starving people in Ethiopia. But he had a good reason. 
He said, Ethiopia is run by a communist dictator. And if I provide money for him, I'm in effect enabling this bad guy who would cause the famine, you know? So that was his rationale. He was happily for the Ethiopians, a very minority view. So the aid passed. But those were these two different guys. Can't imagine two different people, right? Two more different people. When Mickey died in a plane crash in Ethiopia on an aid mission, he left behind a little boy, about three years old, and a pregnant wife, pregnant with twins. And when those babies were born, their godfather was Jack Fields. And about a year later, Jack called me and he wanted me to come to a press conference. And I said, well, Congressman, you know, I don't work for the Houston Post anymore. It had folded. I work for the New York Daily News. And he said, I still want you to come to this press conference. And at the press conference, Jack Fields, this conservative Republican who had never voted for aid for a foreign country, unveiled a program uh, that he was attaching to a must pass bill that funded long distance learning for farmers in Africa so they could learn techniques to plant crops that would resist uh, drought to avoid the famine. And of course, he named it after Mickey. We can do this. We have done this. We have to get back to that place. We just have to, or we will not have a democracy. And I don't think the answer is in Washington. I think it's here. And I think it's us talking to each other. So I think we have to find ways to get people to the table. It will not be easy. We have to find ways to build trust. It will not be easy. It will not happen overnight. But this, I think, is our moonshot. We have, we have got to get this done or we are in a world of hurt and everything that we cherish is at stake. I think Joe Biden is right. That is what is at stake. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people who don't believe in democracy anymore and some of them live here. So that's my challenge. That's why I'm here. Um, and ideas, I know you need to start your meeting uh, and I'm sorry I talk so long, but um, but I am I'm here. I'm at Mizzou. You know how to reach me, and I would love to have a dialogue about how we can proceed from here. And I hope that um, I hope that we can. And and that's why I was so honored that Marilyn asked me because I think um, the League of Women Voters, institutions, and people like you are vital to this. Wow. Thank you so much. That was- You're very welcome. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. You know, a uh, few people have heard this story that I told where uh, earlier this year, I got a new dentist and we were chatting and you know, the dentist says, oh, do you do anything that uh, you're retired? And I said, oh, I'm very involved with the League of Women Voters. Pause. And he said, oh, have you always been interested in politics? And I said, without even thinking, no, it's about democracy. You know, it's not about political parties. It's not about, it's about the system that we wanted to work 